Now today, hey, I got the canopy mold off to Midgley, so if Midgley will get off his ass, so to speak, maybe a week or two from now we'll have some canopies. I also wanted him, I asked him in the note to please shoot a little video of making it, even though we've had that on past videos. We have so many new people now subscribing, I think it would be an appropriate thing. Anyway, every time I pull one of these apart, I love to just, just, just think about that garbage can full of chips that I had yesterday and think about, well, right off the bat that I've just saved some dough, some time, some energy, some money, all of that, all of the above, none of the above. Anyway, this has only been sitting one day, so what happens, you gotta peel it off, it's, it's kinda sticky. But if you compare that to carving and hollowing a top block, and I don't even have to trim it to, to give you a clue here. <laughs> Boink. Anyway, that's the whole bottom line. The bottom line is here. And I wanted to mention another thing, somebody brought this up yesterday. Who the hell was over here? I don't even remember. About molding a leading edge for the wing. Now, it's my understanding Bob Hunt's doing that now, and that definitely is a good thing. If you look back at the old videos, you see Midgley has done that, I've done it. And it's an excellent way of doing it, so if you want to incorporate that into your next Nobler or next SV-11 or whatever, that's an excellent way of doing it. Um, molding this wood like this, and, and I don't care how you do it, this is just one of many techniques in the very beginning, you always get a little disgusted and say, oh, gee, this is a lot of work. But, but boy, when the day comes like today, you go up, you have your cup of coffee, you're all, you know, ready to roll and start rocking and rolling and sanding. You come down and do what I just did, and you have a top block. All of a sudden, like a light goes on in your head, and you say, yeah, that's, that's a good way to build planes. Now, Peabody was, oh, oh Peabody's the one that was over oh, yeah. When Peabody was here, he wants to do some molding for his fuselage. He's going to come over either tomorrow or the next day or whenever. And what I want to try to do is adapt one of my top block molds so I don't even have to make a new mold. So what I think is, I looked in the closet, I have eight or ten of these molds now. What we may be sneaking up on is a thing of like shoe sizes, two, three, four, five, six, that we may have every possible size that, that would fit the smallest 35 to the biggest widest 60 and be able to, to use, like for instance on a turtle deck model, use the front part of this. Midgley wants to make the, the back part of a cardinal in two shells. Well, there's a lot of reasons for doing this, and maybe I overemphasize it, and I say it over and over, I'm getting boring to listen to, but one of the things I always hear from people, I hear it over and over again in my business and in my personal phone calls, oh, I don't have enough time to build, oh, you, oh I, got, I don't have enough time, I, you know. Well, you know what, here you're looking at three, four, five hours saving, you're looking at some dough saving, no matter how you do this, this is a plus factor in your program. So what I'm going to do, I'll probably do it off camera because this is, this is just getting redundant now. I want to make up a <clears throat> another top piece, but I don't really have a good piece of, of wood in four inch wide width. So what I'm going to do is try to put one, and I've never done this before, <clears throat> try to join it so I have a seam going right down the middle and see if I can bury that seam somewhere in this, uh, you know, in the mold. Anyway, I'll try that. You've seen how to bring this up to snuff, get the tail all cleaned up, trim it. We won't go back over that again, but I'm going to give that the cowling mold a little more time to dry, and we may even, by the, before the day's out, be able to lay up the first cowling in that mold. Now, what I did with this, and this, this is something I don't think I've put on the video yet. What I did when I made the mold, I made it a little bit, let's see if we can show this in a way that makes sense. See, I didn't really know if, the, if this piece was going to be a final fit. I didn't know if, I, if this was going to be a perfect match up here. But what happens, since it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, if it didn't match, if it was too small, I could just keep moving this up and trimming it off. Well, I guess I lucked out. That's the bottom line here, is it fits almost perfectly there. But so, now what I have to do is make sure it fits all the way down the body. And this really is, 
This is probably the best fit I've ever seen. This is an amazingly good fit. Now all I need to do is just trim off the back here and sand the rest of this on the mold. But by leaving it a little bit, in fact, I'll even leave this a little bit oversized here. That is really a nice fit. I am really surprised. You can see now, if I hold this up by the Spitfire, you can see this is a much wider body, a deeper body. It's going to be a much, much more scale-like. I guess uh, scale-like is the right word. And I think once that has the canopy on it, that's just going to be an awesome fuselage. It's nice and nice and deep and thick. So once it has those big blisters up there, I think it's going to really be nice. So anyway, now I can finish this off camera. I'll sand this all out, and then I'll have one of these done. Then what I want to do, I'm really, I look through the wood again. I don't have any four-inch wood, so I'm going to, again, I'm going to try, and I never did this before. But it would be good to know this way you could save the time of not having to go through this. I'm going to try to put a seam right down the middle on two pieces and wrap it and see if I can make that seam disappear. Now just one thing, because there's some people that do not see all the videos for whatever the reason. When you have the shell and this, this edge is now finished and sanded, one of the things you want to do is do most of the sanding right on the, right on the mold itself. It gives it a little support. If you're sanding this out in midair, it tends to get twisty and wobbly and everything. In fact, what I've done from time to time, I'm not going to do it on this, this one is pretty decent, is put a little masking tape on each end, sand the whole middle, then take the tape off and just sand the last little bit. But this one, believe it or not, didn't even crack at the end. I don't know if you can see that. Usually they crack right in the back here and you have to do a little mini repair. Nothing. So this was just an exceptionally nice A-grain piece of wood. And this will be one of, the, one of the shells that we actually use here. Again, this is probably a good day. I should be doing this outside. It's one of those nice Jersey fall days. The wind is just blowing a little bit. And I, all this sawdust could be going in the neighbor's yard, choking the squirrels. See, by sanding right on the shell, you really do, you really keep a lot of the integrity at a part, too. And what I do is whenever I'm not using these shells, I tape them to the fuselage so that they don't tend to go back to their original position. That's another nice little tip you can use right away. Now I did try at one time, if you really want to get into overkill, what I did try is I took the part that was all done and ready to put on a plane and put couple of coats of clear dope inside to harden up the wood because I had a piece that was really flimsy and then let it dry as soon as it was dry went back and put it on the fuselage and get it tacked in so that that dope doesn't dry in it because you're re-wetting the wood that way you really don't want to just leave it you would not want to dope this and just put it aside to dry or you, you may have a problem it'll spring back to where it was You can see by sanding on a mold, you can really bear down up on the nose section. Even though this, this taper worked out absolutely perfectly, that doesn't always happen. Sometimes you have to move this forward or back to get that because it's an expanding cone. I guess we just lucked out on this one, or maybe it's that we are getting a little bit, a little bit more technically advanced than when we started this. No, I always like to just tape all the shells right to the fuse while they're in storage. I'm going to put this aside for now, and I'm real happy. This all lined up just better than I could have ever hoped for. Really worked out nice. One done, now I'm going to join up that sheeting and see if I can make a piece with a seam. If not, I'll have to run to the hobby shop and buy some 4-inch wood. But I'll give it a try because I have a lot of 3-inch wood here. Now, I just had a little thought. I figured I'd put this idea on on the uh, video. I'm trying to join up these two pieces. Again, I might be able to do this without, if this piece is unsuccessful and I can't make that seam disappear, what I thought I could do is maybe just put two strips along the side where this is the widest and then the seams would wind up right around the edge where I could bury them easily because that seam I always double silk span. So I'm going to give some thought to that but the first test is going to be to try to do one of these and of course I tape that piece together.
I guess this is similar to join and wing skins, but in this case, this is going to have to be uh, wet and bent. And I don't know if that seam is going to become invisible or not. But again, this just this is just a, I guess a little uh, idea here. You're not going to know unless you try it. And if not, we'll buy more wood. That's all. Now I just relearned a valuable lesson that I always seem to forget is before I sand this out is to scrape the table. There was a, oh, there's another one in there. There was a little dot of CA and it put a big chunk, big uh, gouge in the wood. Again, I'll try to get the block sanding out on a seam before I actually get ready to mold apart. Now, just like wing skins, if you've never done foam wing skins, you want to get as much of the sanding done as you can before you actually put them on the cores. I don't know if this is going to work, but we'll give it a try. And of course, whichever side of the seam looks the best, I'll put that on the outside. Now this is the part everybody loves. Phew! Smell that ammonia, baby. I tell you, it's <laughs> I just can't say it enough how much I like this molding stuff. All right, the next thing I'm going to do here, while well, I'm going to put this aside to dry and see if that cowling mold is ready to run a test. You can run off a little test piece on that. Notice, I, this brings up another excellent point that uh, I'm a firm believer in. Even if you come up with an idea like, uh, and I certainly don't want to pretend to take credit for this molding idea, but when you come up with an idea, constantly look for ways of making it better, lighter, cheaper, freer, whatever. And in this case, now what, what this experiment will let me know is if I can use up three inch wood. Now that opens up the door to a lot of, a lot of things like it opens up the door to using up. You always can get better quality three inch wood than four inch wood or using up scraps. If we can make this seam disappear, and I didn't run the seam right down the middle. It's a little bit off to one side. I just didn't want it being obvious. I figured it was off to the side. I might be able to hide it with an incline or something if it starts popping up. But to constantly experiment. Now, one of the things I was talking to Rich Peabody about, he wants to try is laminating, doing two pieces of 16th with some of that carbon mat in between. Well, now we could do it. And the inside part, the one you don't see, you can put the seam in the wood. Use up the scrap wood. You don't even have to use good pieces of wood here. Or even store-bought pieces of wood. You can line up scraps, assuming that this is going to work. Again, we'll find out when we pop this open tomorrow. You can see how this is relatively hard. I see all the air bubbles. Let's hope they came to the surface. I'll pull off the tape here, pull out the plug, and see if this feels hard enough to run a little test. And I always like to run a test before I make an actual part. Get an idea of how much resin I have to mix, how much cloth is going to go in. Now, we have done these in the past, so I should have a real close idea. But again, always best to do a little test. And one of the tricks I found on pulling one of these silicone molds apart, this doesn't really feel quite dry yet, is you got to pull it apart real slow. The silicone starts to release little by little by little. It doesn't pop. You just keep a steady pressure. Pull it from all four corners. See, this is the kind of thing, if you didn't notice, right now you'd be going, ah! Boy, the first time I did this, I panicked. Oh, I can't get my part out. I can't get my part out. Well, it does, it takes a little time. This really doesn't feel super dry yet. I may, I don't know. Well, okay, you get the idea. Okay. And of course, the quality of the original plug, again, we're hoping the canopy plug is going to work. Dave's already got that. That already went in the mail. So let's hope that uh, we can pull off this stuff. Again, now what I'm going to do is trim the bottom of the box. So what it'll do is it'll give me some support. Let me get rid of this. This is just extra rubber. But you can see the quality of this mold is really pretty decent. In fact, there's one, and it's in a spot that we're going to grind away. There's one piece of wood or something in there. Yeah, it's a chip. See, this is relatively thin, this middle part of the mold. So 
but what I'll do is I'll trim this wood off the box so that this will actually sit flat on the table when we actually actually do get to use this. Now Jim Tishy, and if I remember him, I'm saying his name right, he had given me another good idea that if I wanted to save material I could put filler pieces of wood along here or in corners or just just to save the use of the material. Now this is this is really nice. <laughs> I have to tell you that is a that is a pro stunt mold. I think you can get the get exactly what I've said is the quality of this plug is always going to come out in the final mold. So it really did pay to spend that little extra time sanding primer or whatever as we have a really I'm I'm just shocked how nice this came out. That really is I mean, this is, this is to me, every bit as good as one if you were a professional. You know, when I say professional, I mean doing this for a living, a mold maker. That is really a nice piece of work. Now, as I said a million times, every, every part of this is an ongoing development, and I noticed from picking this up, this is kind of flimsy. So rather than just cut all this wood away, what I'm going to do is make some cross bracing in here out of some balsa wood so that we have the corners connected. I can get some scrap wood and fill this box up. I want to give that some support and I want to support it. See this way it's kind of flimsy. Again, these are the things you don't really know until you make the mold. You, you, you have to do a little experimenting and this is why it's so good to have the video because if you didn't, every person out there that did this would probably make the same mistake over and over. Everybody would make ten molds before they had a good one. Hopefully what you can do is make a good one on the first shot. You make this just a taste oversize. It's the other thing I learned from actually making this mold now, and I've already put the information in, in my little mental bank here, is that that box, that box has to be relatively strong. So maybe in the future we'll make that out of either thicker wood or plywood or something. If we ever do go to make the fuse mold, for a full fuse, I know I'll have to make it out of very solid wood. Because you're actually only using the rubber, the silicone rubber, as the, the mating surface. You just want to have that as the mating surface to these parts. Doing, I'm just using up scraps of wood. I'm filling it. See, I have the grain going this way, and I want some. This is real wide stuff with the grain going this way. Just as support blocks to make this as solid as possible. Again, you don't have to make anything fancy here, but the lesson I learned here is this this outlet, or whatever you want to call this, needs to be solid. I was not aware just how solid it had to be. Just look at any kind of scrap I can use here. Well, one of the things I want to do, you know, last year we did an awful lot of experimenting with resin and came up with a lot of good conclusions, read a lot of literature that confirmed what I had felt all along, but basically I didn't find any magic answers. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with this mold anyway. I want to do a test with the West System resin. Now, we already have this in stock, so this is a good relatively inexpensive, not too toxic, and it comes with these little pumps. You can buy this in a marine supply store. Mixes the ratio exactly right. Big advantage of this is there's no smell to it. I want to make a cowl with this. Then what I'm going to try to do maybe is make one with polyester. And then finally, and I can't do this indoors, I'm going to make one with the Epon 815 and the TETA. The idea of that is I really want to give this a try, having all three of them and see which are the most rigid, the most, um, the lightest, of course, it's the strongest. And it, this material is real easy to use. This is a good in-between, probably in-between Epon and polyester. Polyester is relatively easy to use, tolerant of mixing the wrong amount of hardener. Epoxy isn't. If you put even just a little too much or not enough, you'll lose all of the good qualities of the epoxy. So having this material, this will allow me to do one extra test. And I'll start by doing this test. Basically, there's a good reason, because Karen's home today, and she doesn't like the smell of the polyester. So we'll do this one first, put this one aside to dry, 
Again, this is material that's commercially available. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to use this. Very easy to use. Now for the test, I'll use some e-glass. This is just ordinary fiberglass cloth. Nothing special here. This is really just a test. And what's nice, these resin pumps give exactly the right amount. Now if you haven't used a pump in a long time, it might be a good idea, you know, basically to just pump one thing through to clear it, make sure there's no dust or dirt. I think we'll use three measures of this. Probably these are made by the same company that makes the fuel pumps, the Proston fuel pumps. Anyway, this is a real nice method or way to do this. The trouble with doing epoxy, I mean, one of the downsides of doing this material as opposed to polyester, this is difficult to meter the, the resin if you don't have a pump. The hardener, you've got to get exactly the right amount of hardener in here or you lose all the good properties of the epoxy. Now this is basically marine stuff. It's made for marine use. We made props out of this last year and they, they were unsuitable because it doesn't have a high enough temperature. When you put them out in the sun it, they kind of get wimpy. But this, this is definitely stronger than polyester so we're going to try to do this with as few laminates as possible and some carbon fiber reinforcements. Maybe we'll try making one totally out of carbon fiber too just as a test. Now I also can put a little dye in here and what the dye does it allows me to identify which part goes on which which plane. Kind of a nice little uh, identification mark and I believe for this it's blue. Blue is the West Systems. Yeah I have it on a can. Blue dye. So let me get a little bit of dye put it in your epoxy. I'm gonna have this mark. This is the dye, the West Systems dye. The advantage of this is now if I go back a year from now and I see I have blue, well I know the blue is uh, you know, the stuff I use to do the West Systems. And just a couple little drops of this is all you need. Now another thing with epoxy that a lot of people overlook or have a problem with is epoxy needs to be stirred a lot more than polyester. Epoxy is really needs to be stirred need to get up along the edges of the container. These, by the way, these are special wax proof cups that that are made for this, this type of use. Bob Martens, the guy who does the plans for us, and part of the Spitfire, Sea Fire, British Air Force Invasion Team, or whatever, he, whatever we do call ourselves. He's been along for a long part of the ride. And he will be doing a good set of plans for the Sea Fire. I've already been shipping him parts and templates so that those plans will be accurate. If you make one, you'll be able to get molded parts, fiberglass, cowls, canopies, whatever. That's the whole idea of this. We're really not, this is not entry level stuff. This is stuff for the person who really wants to put their heart and soul into a plane. Okay, now whether you're doing polyester or, you see it's not going to stick to the, the siliconized rubber. So step one is to get a nice little glock in here. Now one of the things if you're doing polyester you could use what they call gel coat to get a pre-finished part. Well, that's of a limited value to us since we're going to put a finish on this anyway. And again, by the end of these experiments I hope I know a lot more than when I started out. And since I was able to use the parts I made last year, they're totally serviceable. I have no reason to think that I can't make them better and better because if even if this doesn't work I can always go right back to the old stuff. Now I always start out I want to get the, the cloth in at about a 45 degree angle. I don't want the, the seams going side to side. 45 degree angle and this, not, this is 4 ounce cloth. This does a real good job of conforming and you might be thinking, oh well, we could do this with Kevlar. Yeah, maybe you could, but Kevlar is, is difficult to get to bend around corners and stuff. Difficult to get the, uh, the same contouring that you get with e-glass. E-glass, by the way, is just a fancy name for fiberglass cloth. The same stuff you can buy at your local, where you buy Bondo in the car parts store. Right there is where they have it. Any place that sells marine supplies will have it. Not a difficult material to find or buy. 
Not expensive either, by the way. You can do a whole cowl probably for a couple bucks worth of material. You'll have enough left over to do eight, ten extra cowls. Now, if we were doing polyester, we would want to be putting what we call chop in the corners. With epoxy, sometimes that's not necessary. Sometimes it is. I don't know. We're going to find out with West Systems if that is important. Because if we don't get nice corners, we'll just repeat this, putting chop in that first level, that first layer. Now I have these little carbon fiber reinforcements. They're just little pieces of carbon fiber. I want to get them up in the nose section. Because that's right where we're going to carve most of this away to allow the engine to sit through here. But what that'll allow me to do is where we locate the pin that actually is the cowl hole down. And I'll put a couple layers of these up here. This is one of the stress points I want to have. Again, this resin is really easy to work with. This is not difficult stuff to work with. There's virtually no odor at all. And I know a lot of a lot of the women in the world, and Karen is certainly one of them, they're very sensitive to the odors of modeling, the dope, the glue, the CA, and everything else. Now, two things happen, too, with epoxy, especially West Systems, that when polyester starts to kick, you get a little bit of a warning, and all of a sudden it's cheese, and then it's cheese for about 10 minutes, and you can still maneuver it around and move it. Epoxy tends to kick differently. It kicks, and then it's all of a sudden it's a solid, and you can't do anything with it. So I'm trying to work a little faster than I normally would if I was using polyester. I can lay in some of the reinforcements. And again, the reason for these, basically we're going to be cutting a lot of this away for the, the motor and the muffler and whatnot. So the strongest piece has to be this nose section because it's going to get ground away to almost nothing. Again, in the very beginning of doing this work, I was real unfamiliar with using this material, and Ed Gallagher, I just keep mentioning his name over and over, he was so helpful, and he really did, he really did make possible a lot of things that would have otherwise been impossible. Jim Tishy, keep saying his name, he's one of the people that uh, was on board for many, many Spitfire videos and helped me out with a lot of technology. He's a professional mold maker. Now, I don't know. I've heard other people say that I do a good job of giving the people credit that do things. Well, I think that's only right. I don't think that's anything special. That's, that's the way it should be for everybody. Nothing hurts a hobby worse than when everybody tries to take claim for the same invention, and then you find out none of them invented it. Somebody 40 years ago invented it, and they're not telling you. <laughs> okay, now, I also wanted to get a couple reinforcing layers back here. Again, this is where the bolt hold down is going to be, so so we really have some places two layers of four ounce, some pieces one layer of four ounce, but now I also take, and these are carbon fiber strips, because in the front here where this, this is where it's going to take a lot of stress. We're going to relieve this for the needle valve hole and everything. This is going to take a lot of stress up here, so. Again, this can be a nice modeling, you know, modeling material, I guess, is the right word. Just needs a little bit of orientation, and the videos that I got from other companies were helpful, but, but certainly they didn't exactly tell me everything I needed to know. And I hope by the end of this series of videos that, you know, that we have all the information you would ever need to make one of these cowls, to make, we're going to make the cannons by the way too. We're definitely doing cannons this year. I'm trying to come up with some hard rubber so that they'll be flexible in case somebody that's launching a plane grabs a cannon or something. There's a funny story about Jim Kostecki's model. He had a model with big points on the tail like a stingray and somebody was launching it at a contest and it hooked on a belt loop. They were hand launching it and of course, it was a total disaster. The plane they let go, and the plane hooked onto the belt loop, and I can imagine it was a flying circus for the next five minutes. But anyway, this is about it. I'm going to just pat this down now. And the final step of this, of working with epoxy, is to blot out all the extra epoxy. And that just gets rid of some of the weight. 
Notice I'm getting everything good and soaked. And the last step is to blot out all the epoxy, all the extra. You know, the strength to weight ratio is directly related to how much cloth or toe you can put in. You want to use as little resin as possible. It's the resin that adds weight. Okay, I think we can put this aside to dry till tomorrow. The last thing, I wanted to put a couple little reinforcing pieces right on the edge here. And this is the side that will get cut out for the muffler. So a little bit of a reinforcement there will be a little cheap insurance. Now I finished this up by just adding some of this Dave Brown carbon fiber toe and you can see how nice it spreads. As the epoxy starts to kick off and get sticky, you know, I can just keep patting it down into the corners. It takes a little, uh, little touch, I guess. Otherwise, you get the hairs and it all pulls up. You can just keep feeding it down. Once you, do, once you get this little technique down, boy, you're, you're home for you all. And I notice carbon. Now, the carbon in the, uh, the West Systems is going to be relatively, uh, well, I hope, not relative, I hope it's going to be very strong. But again, I, I know the strongest will be the epon. That has to be post-cured and everything. But for right now, to get a cowling on a plane so we can start working it, I think this will be fine. This is going to be mostly carbon and e-glass, West Systems resin. And I'll put this aside to dry. Now, if you have a heating vent somewhere, and I, I don't have the heat on today, the heating vent, to put this right by the heating vent, this probably would dry, I guess, in a few hours, but I'll let it sit overnight. This is about it for this session. Put the, put the resin away, wipe the ends of the can, otherwise it starts turning into chewing gum. And any resin that you have left over, you know, drink it. Hey, it's delicious. Try it. Anyway, we'll pick this up the next time we get to work down here. Now what we're trying to do here is add a little bit of trim. We get this, this little spot where we had the hatch, filling that in with some red lead. Don pulled up the tape, and I want to put some checkerboards in here before we shoot the clear, and then do this touch up. Now, if you want to see an unbelievable ordeal, unbelievable, put a couple ink lines on a plane today. <laughs> Getting a plane in this car is an unbelievable, next time he's over here, I'm going to videotape how to plane. You got to move the seats, take the roof off, open the hood, take a tire off. Unbelievable. But believe it or not, there's living proof. It does fit inside the car. Everybody that ever sees these videos wants to know how you get that plane in the car. <laughs> I'm going to videotape it next time. Right. Look at this. The man's plane is bigger than his car. Oh, yeah, I already took a picture of it. You don't have to show. You don't have to confess. When Midgley's here, we're going to videotape this. Next week. Next week. Stay tuned. <laughs> okay, here we are. Day after this was molded. Ooh. Now, one of the nice things about, this is a prototype, of course. This is just a test. Oh, see, we got an air bubble in it. Another air bubble down here. Now, these, this can be cured. This is the first one I did with the West Systems resin. You can see it's got a res relatively nice finish, and it's solid. So one of the things I'm going to do now, I'm going to take chop in the next one I do, and I'll do it off camera. I won't even do it on camera because it'll pretty much be the same. Take some chop, which is the little fibers that are just powdered off of the scraps, and I make a powder out of it so it, ma it, it looks like I don't know, like epoxolite, I guess. And you do put that in all the corners. I didn't even do that on this because this was just a test. Round these corners and edges. And I'll run another one of these off. Now, I guess for the first shot out of this mold, this is pretty decent. And if I wanted to, I actually could just patch this up. Maybe what I'll do is with some of the little resin that's left over, I'll make a little patch on that. And then I'll have a usable... Actually, I'll have, what, what this will be is a giveaway cowl to somebody. If there's anybody out there that wants a free cowling, it'll have a patch in it. But uh, if you're building a sea fire or you just want to have one, you can have it for nothing.
Now this is the product that I mix with the resin just so I want to get this if anybody wants that phone number. By the way, these people are really good to deal with. They really know what the hell they're doing. And this is 132nd mil fiber. Just to give you an idea what this looks like. It looks like like powder. I mix this in with the resin and I'll make a little yeah, it's look like it looks for all purposes like talcum powder, but what it does it makes a thick viscosity paste and that gives us the nice corners. Now you don't really, you know, you don't really, really need this, but this does make it a lot easier. By the way, this is this is a phone number. If you know somebody out there uh, wants to try some of this stuff, fine. Or if you want to get a small amount from me, even better. Now this is the deal. You mix that that fiber with with the resin. Let me show this because this is this is kind of a significant thing, I guess. If anybody really did want to know how to do this right, ooh. This is nice and thin. You can see how it drips. And you mix up the mud, just a little paste till it gets what I call fixotropic. It doesn't drip right off the brush. And that becomes the material. Let me get this out of the way. That becomes the little material that you can use for, and I'm just blobbing this on right now. I'm not being real careful because it sands relatively easily. West Systems resin is, from my past experience, real easy to sand in and blend in. By the way, this is how you would do a patch, and I did patches years ago on boats. You can make your own little patches, and they're just cosmetic. These have no strength. This is just like when you do an epoxylite fillet. But anyway, that'll make this a salvageable, usable part, and I'm just doing this for more or less for an X. In fact, there's a little piece up here. Now, the whole deal here is where the hell's that mold? Now, when you go in to make a lay up a new mold, boy, this sticky glass fibers here. Okay, now the trick with this would be, and this took me a long time to figure this out. And in fact, I had to watch a couple of these the, the videos from fiberglass to figure it out. If you paint this the material with the chop, and the reason I put the black dye in here is so I can see the air bubbles a little easier. That blue is a really funky color to work with. Now see what happens. This stays in the corner. It retains its shape. It's thixotropic. Thixotropic means it doesn't drip and run down. And in theory it should be just a little bit lighter since less of it is resin and more of it is is actually to chop. And you could chop up all your scrap fiberglass, all your, fi all your scrap uh, Actually, you, this, this scrap that you normally throw away you can turn into useful stuff this way. Now, let's see if, and again, we'll, I'm willing to learn, that's for sure. Let's see if this one I do lay, I'll lay this up off camera, by the way. This is getting kind of labor intensive here. But the purpose of getting this is to get it in all the corners. And this doesn't pull up. See, the other stuff shrinks a little. It pulls up out of the sharp corner. And when I lay this one up, this should be, let's hope, this should be, you know, a real, a finalized part. I thought one other tip worth putting on the video, a lot of people, I'm just going to show this. This is what happens to scissors when you cut fiberglass, and I just re-remembered re this after all last year. You cut it, and you get this, it makes you crazy. So you then, what you wind up doing is throwing the scissors away or you wind up doing sloppy cuts. Now I'm gonna, while that cowl is uh, curing out there, I only have a little bit of time left tonight. If you take a brand new X-Acto blade and stack up newspaper, what you'll find out is no matter what weave it is or what cut, you can make beautiful cuts. And you can make them over and over and over. So I'm gonna tool up here to make four or five more cowlings. And then, of course, what I'll do is keep the best two for the planes that Joe and I are going to make. Have a couple extras for customers, and I'm sure there's people out there that are going to be building these things. And they always, plus the other thing is they're always looking to get them for free, so this way I can use up my, pretty much use up my scrap anyway. But this is a tip worth its weight in gold, no matter what fiberglass you're using. Worth the price of the video. Newspaper and a brand new blade, and you can cut fiberglass all day long. Now, one of the things I did yesterday is I put the mold, now you can see if I can get in close on this. I put the mold vertically. Let's see if you can just get a reference of where vertical is here. 
put it vertically so that all the extra resin tends to run down and into the extra little the grooves or whatever you want to call them where we would expect an air pocket might uh, happen. Now, looking, at, I don't want to pull this one over, but that worked out real well on this one so far. So that little extra resin we can sand out if you really want to go for super, super, super light. But anyway, these will be real, I think this is going to be real good and real strong. I put some carbon in here and some mat just to see. And what I did, I cut up a bunch of other material. I also cut this up for my next test. I want to run this around the edge. And this is like a ribbon and it has an edge that has a weave in it. So what it is when you want to get an edge on something, this gives you a little extra material, a little extra strength right in the edge. But we'll give that a try next time we get to work on this. Don't think I'm going to get to do much more on this, but that can be drying up, and that's a good little tip. And also, we'll see how that one bakes up to by tomorrow, and uh, hey, we'll be back. We have other little projects to work on, top blocks, whatever, but once we get these in position, then we can start finalizing the fuselage. Now this is the original one we molded up, our original test. I'm going to cut most of the rough edges away, so I want to sand this down. I want to sand, just grind this down, these little patches that we made. Now that's where there's an air bubble, and again, being able to patch it is a critical part of, uh, if you're going to make a mold, you got to be able to do a little patch like that. And then I'll pull that other one out and see if we have any air bubbles in that one. I'll patch them up too. Now the easiest way to get this flat is to just run it onto a belt sander. If you don't have a belt sander, you'll need some kind of a sanding block or something to get that edge true. Now I always check to make sure I'm not getting too close. And in the last little bit, I'll do very, very slowly. So we're getting down to the real nitty gritty here. So now, very small little amounts. I don't want to undercut it. By the way, this is real good. If you have long fingernails, just run them into the belt sander. have most of the rough cuts, the flats and this flat surface here with the belt sander. The rest of this I can do with a Dremel tool or just sand it with a sanding block with some 220. What I'm mainly interested in is seeing how these patches work out because I'm not real familiar with patching West Systems resin. I want to see if these patches blend in nice. If not, I'll have to go to a material like Bondo or something similar to that. I can also use a Dremel tool to cut out the hole and notch out the front for the, uh, the nose ring. And the reason I'm doing this is I want to see if this is the way I'm going to want to patch air pockets. So far it looks like it's staying in there, but I'll know when I get the final sanding on it. Now I can also cut this hole out. Obviously a good time to wear some safety glasses or something.
Now it looks like this, the patch that we made, and that's really the whole reason for doing this, the patch is certainly acceptable. I don't know if it's going to hold up in time. But you could always go back even if you missed it and get a second coat on it. This stuff sands. It's a good idea not to breathe the dust in, of course, if you could do this outside or by a, uh, a fan or something or use a mask, whatever. I have this sanding thing, sanding vacuum, so it takes most of the dust away. So in a matter of, say, 15 minutes or 10 minutes here, we've got a cowl ready to go fit onto the airplane. Now, just a couple of tips that'll be, I'm sure, will be a big help here, and I've, I've kind of relearned some of these along the way. Number one is you don't want to get any fiberglass epoxy surface really, really, really smooth to let where it's like a shiny, buffed-out part, because what's going to happen is the auto primer isn't going to stick to this, or the dope, or whatever you decide to finish with. So what I try to do is get down to even, even to 400 sandpaper, but always leave it a little scratchy and gritty before I go on to the next step. Now what I want to do, to, by the way, the patch looks like it's going to work absolutely perfectly. So what I'll do is my black cowl, now I pulled this one out of the mold before. This one has an air pocket in it too, so I'll do the same thing. As I lay up the next cowl, I'll use the leftover resin to patch this, and of course tomorrow then I can work on this one. Now what I did different on this one, I used a lot more carbon in here just to see if it was necessary. And this I think is going to be overkill. This one's a lot heavier than the blue one. This one is, is like almost like air. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to lay the next one up and I'm going to put probably three layers of a four ounce cloth in here and maybe just one strip of carbon or some carbon up in the nose here. But I think what I've done is I've put a little bit too much material. I'm making these stronger than they have to be. And I really don't want to make them any heavier than they have to be because then it, it distorts the whole program here. I, don't, I want to be able to take all the nose weight out or put all the nose weight in. Now that's one final thought is you could always, if you, if you had a plane that needed an ounce of nose weight and you already had flown a plane, you could go make up a second cowl and put in 10 layers of fiberglass cloth, put lead in here, <laughs> whatever. But you would have the weight down low and not on the spinner where it would be a lot more effective. On the spinner it's creating GP and everything. So ha being able to do that real conveniently and easily, it, it's, it's just one of the options you have when you're dealing with fiberglass instead of balsa wood. To go out and carve another cowl, oh my god, it would be unbelievable. But this I could actually, even along the process, make two cowls, a heavy one and a light one, so that they both fit in and it isn't a whole lot extra work to do that. It's, it's actually just like having adjustable lead outs and a ray rudder and a lot of little things you don't think of that the, how significant they are. Somewhere down the road you realize, oh gee, wouldn't it be nice to put more nose weight? Oh, gee, and I hate to put it on this crankshaft. Oh, I'll just put the heavy cowl on. It's a quarter ounce heavier, a half ounce or whatever. Bingo. So that's one of the choices we have with this kind of a system. Now we have to sand this out. What I did, I, I just keep pushing this down into the mold. I can't get it out now. <laughs> the idea is, once this is all sanded out, of course this is ready for auto primer, but I still have to put the a 64th plywood edge on this. So what I do is I drop this down into the mold, and I can pick up any high spots, or any spots I can just run my finger along here and feel if there's a high spot. And this I like to do with a sanding block, that, that sandpaper I've glued to the table is a good way to do it, by the way. And just pick up any high spot. I want this to actually sit down into the mold a 64th of an inch. Then I'm going to lay that piece of 64th plywood on here. And then put it back in a mold so that the 64th plywood is perfectly even with the top. Then I know each one, when I make the next one, will be exactly the same. Because if you didn't do that, some might stick up a 64th or down a 64th. So in essence, this gives you just one more way of getting all of them exactly the same. Yeah, you want to try to get the pressure down even on the whole part. So I love that sound, huh? And then this piece will be ready to glue down to a 64th plywood.
Now you can see right here, I'm going to do this on a close-up, that I do have what I think is, come on, get back down there, just about the right amount. Now, obviously, if you left too much or not enough, what will happen, this nose ring won't marry up real nice. So now, even if what I what was happening, if I even put took too much off, and I think I got it real nice, if I took too much off, I could just glue another piece of 64th plywood on here and then block sand it down and it gives me that nice edge. It also acts like a rib around the edge. Okay, now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to glue this guy down to the 64th plywood, then I'll take the mold, lay up another one. What I want to try, now, you can see how I laid this one up. What I want to try on the next one, I want to try a little, I think I put this on a video already, I put a little less carbon in here, and use two layers of the four ounce cloth. I think, see what I think I can do now, this is this is the important idea here. I now that I have one in my hand, I can see the weight of it and everything. I think I can make this even just a little bit lighter by losing one layer of the cloth and some of this carbon. This is really, I mean, you 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 can't even hit that. So I don't want to overdo the strength part of this. And that's the nice thing. Now molding up another one will only be about a 10-minute job. I'll glue this to the plywood, and while this is while this is kicking off, I can be working on that cowling. See, that's what's nice. Get two or three things going at the same time. You can bounce back and forth. You don't waste a lot of time. Now, what I think the easiest way to do this is get some thick CA. Get a bead of it going right around. Now, you'll notice I'm using a flat glass table because I want to keep this edge flat. Again, I can use this edge. This is going to be a little bit of a, a spar to keep it from getting a little bit too oil canny. Grain going a long way. Just a bit of kicker here. This is getting to be old CA. Here's one of the nice things. See, once this is on and I know it's flat, I can drop a few drops of CA down in there since most of that wood is going to get ground away eventually. Whatever drips in, drips out, make... There we go. I can get a little bead going. Just like when you do a nose section. You can watch that bead. Whoop, there it goes. That gives me a nice bead inside and now I can start trimming this away. I always want to trim this plywood just a little bit oversized because in the back it's going to have a taper to it. So I'll leave a little bit extra on there. Now the nice thing about making these up is once you have that mold, it's, I, I, it's hard to explain. It's like uh, hatching chickens out of eggs. They just come jumping out. It's, it's just so much different than when you look at a block of wood. And I keep saying this over and over again. Because I'll tell you what, in, in the 40 years or so I've been modeling, I'm kind of getting sick of wood, to tell you the truth. And this really is getting to be exciting. Okay, so we got that on there. Now the next thing, I want to trim this whole edge on a belt sander, and then I can cut out the inside for the motor. This all, From this point on, this goes real fast. back lip you want to leave just a little long so you can get a nice razor edge on there. See this last, this, this back edge needs to be just dressed off and brought to a point. Probably the only tricky part on the whole cow. Now one thing it really looks like is where these patches were, they just totally have disappeared back into the cowling. So what that tells me too is, this is the first time we're really doing these with West Systems resin that it's very easy to repair this resin. It's a very easy to sand. You can see how nice it just butters right off. 
nice, nice material to work with for this application. Now I'm just going to interpolate this, I guess about a quarter of an inch. I want to leave the back, the back piece in here and a radius. Just rough it out for now. Reason for this is I want to be able to put that the bolt hold down piece in there, and this will of course be the part that holds it on. This is just to rough my my cutter out when I dremel this out. And leave that back back piece in there. dress off all the edges and what I want to do is I want to get even more of a bead of the thick CA down around in here now that I can get at that conveniently in fact I can get a brush down and they get all dust out all these chips come out okay this is ready to go mount on the fuselage here What I want to do, though, in the meantime, because I want it to be drying tonight, I want to lay up another another one, and then whatever time I have left over, I'll mount this up to the fuselage and work on it. That bead of thick CA in there, by the way, strengthens it up quite a bit. Now, what I'm doing, I'm putting a little bit of a shim in a nose ring here. What I did, I, I took the, the fuse, taped this top block down, the, which is now the bottom block, as tight as possible, and I, it's of what I did, I sanded the front in just a little bit cock, so I made a 64th shim out of the 64th plywood, and I'm just getting this all shimmed in until I get exactly the fit that I want. What it is right now, it's cocked just a little bit off to one side, and I, well, I can sand that nose ring and use that nose ring as a shim and get a real good alignment here. Now, unfortunately, I just got a phone call that terminated the day. <laughs> I have to go do another another mission of mercy over at my two-family house, so I'll pick this up either tonight or tomorrow, but shimming this out, now this is one of the steps a lot of people would maybe tend to skip, and I don't want to skip over this, I want to do this in detail, so I'm going to pick this up on uh, a session that I have a little more than the five minutes that's left in this one. Now you can see how this is favoring one side rather than the other, and I've been running a belt sander and just touching it, just touching that nose ring little by little, and you can see where I've got a shim actually on one part here. Okay, after several trips to the belt sander, I've got a little extra wood around here, a little bit of extra wood around here. This can all be blended in, and I've got the nice clearance out in the front here, but again, the day is shot. I got maintenance to do, so see you on the next session. Now, I came home from my escapades today. The squirrels are back in my house and they've destroyed it. It looks like this is going to be a blown out weekend. I came back to the mail and a new friend of mine, Robert Black from Florida, has sent me a, a Spitfire poster. I'll put this up on the, the screen. This is really a beauty. This is really something special. The he also sent in, and I had loaned him some Spitfire videos, he sent in these Blue Angel videos, which I haven't seen yet. I'm going to watch them a couple of times here, but I just took a quick review of them. Awesome stuff, awesome. So if anybody's interested in Blue Angel kind of stuff, by the way, the Blue Angel, the one that Larry Scarin's in, worth mentioning, this is this poster. I have to get a frame or some way of hanging this up on a wall. The Blue Angel, uh, for anybody's information that Larry Scarinzi had, which is Nostalgia Legal, and somebody had built one and flew at last year's Nats, I have video of it. Uh, that was an excellent flying airplane. Little known, I guess, I guess, uh, I guess <laughs> Mr. Black didn't know that I had made a Blue Angel at one time and it was a complete failure. So I don't go showing a lot of pictures of that on video. It was about two pounds too heavy. Anyway, I really appreciate these posters, and I'm not going to get to work tonight. But it's what's happening is I'm just getting behind the eight ball here with other stuff. But don't ever buy a two-family house, no matter what anybody tells you. It's a pain in the ass. It eats into your modeling time. Anyway, I love the poster, and I will find a, a place to hang it up.
special place. Thanks a lot, and anybody interested in borrowing a video, just let me know. Now I can just hear Adamuska going, ooh, ooh, ooh. Early version, one radiator. See, we these are the things that are the Siamese exhaust. Oh my god, I love this. I I don't know. And before I had ever built these Spitfires and Seafires, I had no idea how much I was gonna fall in love with these planes. They are just they are really becoming a kind of a crazy part of my life. Now I gotta tell you, this this is the earliest I've ever gotten a Christmas card. This is from South Africa, from Percy and his wife. Last year they uh, they came to our contest. I have to tell you, this is unbelievable. This is like the seventh of November. Percy, here in America, we celebrate Christmas on December twenty fifth. Anyway, I will send him a nice card, of course. But uh, you know, I, I guess down south, uh, who knows? He's from South Africa. I don't know how to deal with this. I don't know if I should send the card now or not. Anyway, thanks a lot to Percy. Now, the first thing I want to do today, I want to make sure I have this completely centered. Put the slightest little line on here as a center line, so I know I've always got it on center. I want to make a little lip for my in here of 64th plywood. I want to get the grain bending this way. So let me, it'll be like a little footprint that I can use and it's just a random thing that I can get on the inside of that and that'll hold my blind nut in place. But after rethinking this out, I want to make a little improvement here. I was trying to figure a way Again, this is this is the sequence of things that always happens. You come up with an idea, and in the middle of doing it, I figured out a way that'll make this even a little bit better, a little bit stronger. Because we're going to have those air outlets here, I want to take a whole piece of 64th plywood and line that whole edge. I think this, and I'll go back maybe an inch or so into the fuse. I think this will be a uh, oh, well, a decent a decent way of doing this. See, what I'm looking to have happen is it'll reinforce this whole edge all in one piece so that once I get this piece final, in other words I can't put this piece on permanently and run my 64th plywood edge up here until I have the wing and the body. But once that's glued in what I can do is bolt the cowling on and the cowling will actually hold this in position as I line up the whole back. So I'll be using the cowling piece as one of my alignment keys to hold that bottom block in place. So I think Given that, I think this little bit of extra plywood up here will be a good investment in having some a nice edge on there. That will give me a nice edge and some structural integrity at the same time. I want to get about an inch of this in there. Boy, nothing can be more aggravating than, you know, and I've had this happen a year into the life of a plane, the cowling bolt or the tank vent or some other little Mickey Mouse thing comes loose and what happens now everything's oil soaked to repair it is a major nightmare this will be very very inexpensive insurance and that will give me that little edge there that I'm looking for you know what that will do is inside here that will give me a nice footprint to mount that cowling the little piece of plywood that needs to hold the blind nut for the cowling that that looks like I should have done that on a Spitfire. In fact, that looks like the best way to do it. I don't remember if I did it that way on a Spitfire, but the idea is not to have this cowling this cowling thing in in a very flimsy area, and this spreads out the load over a larger spot. This is one of those spots where I want to get a real nice, neat, even cut. By the way, I've been watching this Blue Angel movies, Bob sent two of these movies. They are awesome very inspiring. I wouldn't rule out the possibility of sometime in the future making a Blue Angel jet. Only a good one this time. Not not a clunker like the other one was. Now with that little piece in there I can dress off the edge. I don't know if the camera can pick up in there how that worked. That, that really was a nice little improvement, a little upgrade to our uh, cowling mounting system. Bob Martens, I'm sure he'll include that in on the Seafire plans. 
Every time you can improve the breed just a little bit, it'll make the next model just a little better. And then when people build from plans, they're building the latest version with all the updates. They're not building, you know, the clunker of the 50s or whatever. After making that alignment, I can see I've got just enough. Boy, that just worked out perfect. Now I need to make up a little plywood piece for a cross here so that I'll be able to put a blind nut in there, a piece of eighth-inch plywood. Now the way to get this, the cowl usually acts as a little template, and that's kind of easy to figure out. See, a lot of times figuring out these shapes can really be a bear. But you know you have the cowl already made up. Now you know you're also going to have to get that angle on there, so that when it matches, you're going to have that angle. Well, first thing I'll do is cut this a little bit oversized, take it out on a the uh, the sanding disc and then just try to blend that in and just fit it, blend it, fit it, blend it. It takes a few shots but ultimately that's the easiest way to get that little piece with the notch in it with the little the little relief angle on one end. Now you always seem, no matter how careful you are, you always seem to have to take the last few shavings off with a little piece of sandpaper on a hardwood block. I want to get a real, real nice fit. Now of course the thing I want to do is have this little piece glued in parallel to the side. I don't want to have it tilting forward or back so that the blind nut will sit in there on a, a very an angle that's, that's perfectly parallel to the surface. Okay, that's ready to glue in. You always like to glue this in so it sits up just a little bit. Now I'll take that sanding tool and just kiss that edge so I have a perfectly flat surface there. And this is where that little sanding tool comes in real handy. You can take the last few thousands off to get that really nice, nice flat fit. And the whole thing is when that goes on there, to have the alignment and have a minimum, a minimum gap around the whole edge. Let me line that up. I just put a coat of thin CA on here. Let this kick off. This just hardens up the edge now that I have it pretty much the way I want it. And I can take that tool. Constantly keeping the edges hard with hot stuff is a good tip. That's a tip worth its weight in gold. Raw balls to edges, every time you do that, boom, you got a ding. Once they're hardened up with, thick, with thin CA, it, it's pretty bulletproof. Now one of the things I wanted to mention is, and I've been taking real good advantage of this because I still have this this workload that's, uh, I don't know, I, the, the word is ridiculous, I don't know why. There's so many things in my life that I just can't control it. I find it necessary to come, I come down in the morning before breakfast, I come down after lunch, uh, I'm always trying to get little work sessions in now this morning, in roughly uh, an hour, or whatever, I managed to get another piece in the puzzle here. And I hear this all the time from people, that, oh, I don't have enough time to build, I don't have enough time to build. Yeah, well, you, you got to kind of make some time. This is one of the things, and this is one of my little tricks for when you're going to be working kind of on a labor-intensive thing. And this, this, even though every time I think this work over at the house is finished, I wind up with a clogged drain or a squirrel eating a house or a load of dirt or something, it's always that these little sessions really get a lot accomplished. So, And I did get a lot accomplished here. Next step, next time we get to work on this is going to be I'll put the cowl bolt hole down, the pin in the front, cut all the holes for the engine, get the engine in place, make sure the tank fits, finish up that part of it, and gee, it's starting to really shape up. Th this is really starting to get to be a fun project now. Okay, what a day. What a day. Storming away out there. I want to tape the cowling and maybe get these holes lined up tonight. Easiest way I know of is to get the cowl tape securely in place, and this is that real sticky, gooey tape we have. We're always trying to use up. We're going to drill a hole in the front for the pin. This will hold it in place. And the first thing is to line up a pilot hole right here for the blind nut. Now the next thing, once that the pilot hole is drilled, is get this lined up again. The tape holds it in position. Drill that nose ring hole.
And as always, the trick is just go slow and use a real nice sharp drill. Don't use up one of those windy drills that has no, uh, no edges left. Okay, that's going to be for our pin, and this will be for the blind nut. So I'll pull this apart, get the blind nut set up in there. Sideway side, go look at it. We just had the porch removed, and Craig has never seen a house without the porch. <laughs> you open the door to go outside, and there's no, there's no porch. Anyway, little surprises in the life of Wendy. Anyway, part of this whole trick is use the tape to hold it in position. This is the best trick. Get that in position. Now that's probably the best way I know of to get this all in alignment. And the only the only way you can get this out of position is if you were to be drilling these holes, and I've seen people do this on a non-90 degree angle. They have the drill on a side or back or forth, and you kind of kind of do it by eye, and you got to go slow. Now this will be our little pin hole down, and we'll eventually put a little arrow shaft piece in here. But what's nice is now we have that hole in there. I can put the blind nut in next. Now I always like to put the blind nut in, see what I'm using, I'm using the plywood to just stretch it. Put a little bit of WD-40 on a bolt so it doesn't, doesn't get caught up when you put a little thick CA. Now I'll take a little Q-tips in there, put a little thick CA on that, but I have some WD-40 on a bolt so that'll at least lock it in position temporarily. Now, I don't want to tell you how many times I've done this and not had WD-40 on the bolt. And all of a sudden, I have a, uh, a nice locked up system. It's, it's a little embarrassing the first time you glue the bolt in position. Okay. Now I want to take the cowl. I want to fit that bolt and get rid of the lock washers now. I have to relieve this hole in the cowling just a little bit for the bolt head. Now by putting a bolt all the way in, I can verify that I haven't changed the alignment on anything. Okay, now the cowling is in place, but of course I want to pin this front piece. I want to take a piece of eighth-inch music wire cut it about a quarter of an inch and press it in through there and make sure that then locks me right into alignment. I want to put a little bit of a radius on the front of this pin just to make guiding it in just a little bit easier. I've got a part of this that's going to wind up going through the fiberglass. I want to put a little little bit of a texture on it so that the glue gets a good grip. Again, that's just there so the glue will get a little bit better grip on it. See if we can see this up close. Now I want the radius end to stick out and the part with a little bit of little scratches on it to be in here so that the glue will get a little bit better bite. What you always want to make sure before you final glue this in, I just tack this in. You usually, and this is the trick of tricks, you usually have to take the drill hole that you have here and drill it up on just enough of an angle that you get a little bit of a radius in here. The reason is when you go to drop this in, it isn't a slide fit. You, with the motor in place, you can't just slide it forward. You have to kind of hook it and drop it back. So it's a little bit of a, a tricky thing to get that, that hole angled up just enough. Now, of course, we could put the pilot screw in. This is nice. Tighten that up, make sure we have the fit we want, and then I'll put a final final bit of epoxy back here to hold that in. You can see I just put a blob, let that sit there, 
that'll kick off and that'll hold the pin in I guess semi-permanently as we go on to doing all the cowl fits. Now I want to tighten down the engine and start cutting all the fits and holes and clearances that we need to get around this. Always a good idea too to get the engine in exactly how you want it at this point in time with the offset push the offset off to one side and start getting this finalized. And just see if this fits right on. Okay, preliminary fit is real nice. Make sure we haven't missed any alignment here. First thing I want to do is cut this hole wider for the bolt so I can put that little piece of arrow shaft in there. Now one of the things I just did, I took a fender washer, it's an oversized washer, put it onto the plywood, put some slow dry and CA on it, and I just socked the bolt down. Now what I have is I have a little bit of clearance here, I can go back, forth, back, forth, just a tiny bit before I make the commitment that I'm finished here. And just by tightening that down, now that, what that does, it gives you a perfect side to side clearance, front to back clearance. Once that washer dries in place, it holds the bolt real tight, because what will happen with wood, eventually that will get loose, and then the cowling starts getting sloppy. Right now that's just about right. Okay, now you can see that washer that's already in there. What that does, it gives it a real nice place for that to bite down, and also it should never in time have any kind of side play or anything, because what happens, as soon as you get a little a little side play, the cowling doesn't line up just right, then it twists one way, then something else happens. This way you're, re you're locked into steel. It, it really is one of those things that adds a, adds a lot of longevity to the cowl. Now you look down in the old tune pipe box, find a scrap piece of some a little bit smaller than standard arrow shapes. Now with a brand new X-Acto knife I can just cut through the, the fiberglass real slow, take a little bit at a time, a little pencil shaving at a time until that arrow shaft drops right in there. Again, this, this is one more of those little devil in the details. When the guys do appearance judging and they see little details like these arrow shafts around the screw heads, it just gives the plane a really, a really professional machine tool room look, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> to get that angle just right, it takes, it's certainly not a 90 degree angle, it takes a few test fits. Because I want to get this arrow shaft to press down flat on that washer before I glue it in. Now once you get it running flat, give it a little dot of CA. Now with the CA kicked, you can see that axe actually has a little spar. It gives this just a little bit extra strength down in the corner there. And I'll just trim this off with a zona saw and then block sand it smooth. Just one more of those little, I guess, devil in the details is an overused term. I'll just take a sanding block and just dress that off till it's just level with the surface around it. See now, just as an example, we've tried to use all the ideas that work so well on the Spitfire project, and and the cowling was absolutely one of them. I mean, that's cowling was perfect. The air cooling ducts we're going to try to steal, similar to the Spitfire. The bracing inside, similar. But any chance we get to make a little improvement, either to make it a little bit lighter, a little bit stronger, or in this case, a little more scale-like, we go with it. But we don't want to lose any of the integrity we had with the Spitfire. All these little ideas work so well, and they're proven in time. This is not some experimental thing. And you go out to do it, and you find out, mm, the guy never even checked it. All proven stuff. And these cowls are just one of the pieces. Now, the first hole is the needle valve hole. And what I do, I sight right down here, and I know I have this break point going right in the middle of the needle valve. So it's real easy to make a little tracing. Get the first part on here, and just dremel it out with a little dremel bit.
Now with that half of the needle valve hole in place, we can go on to the exhaust. Okay, I can just estimate, and what I do, I work off the exhaust and just run the lines up here. Now I need to get, change the view a little bit. See, this ends right about at the end of the fins. So I want to come out just a little bit. I don't want to, I don't, especially on this side, because this is where most of the heat will be. I don't want to limit myself here. And now I can grind. Let's see, I get to the next one. Next one. Right about there. Okay, we got that part of it under control. Now with the cowling bolted in place, it's real easy to interpolate where this would be. And what I like to do is continue this down, but what I like to do is do it with a ruler of some kind. Again, these, these Sharpie markers write real well on fiberglass, so maybe a tip you can use. And I need to interpolate. I know I'm off the front of the fins by sixteenth of an inch. And I know I have to get that curve in there. And of course, I'll use the same Dremel tool and just Dremel out these areas. Now, I always have to be careful when I go through this plywood so I can slit this with a zona saw first, so that'll break out in one nice neat piece. If you don't cut that plywood edge, it's really difficult to get through there. Now one of the areas you can really paint yourself into a corner on is having a needle valve hole that's just a little bit too small. Now the reason, I always leave it a little bit bigger. And there's a good reason, because if you put more or less offset in a motor, this hole is going to move forward and back, and not every motor is exactly the same. So this gives you a little bit of, I always oversize it just a little bit. Now this may seem like really like overkill, but believe me it isn't. What I do is I have my bag with all the spare motors. I have a K motor, which is a late model 60, and one of the old motors that's a, a 5651 variety, and I want to make sure that I've got enough clearance around that they all fit. See, some of these are machined here a little differently. Some of them have the mounts machined just a little different. Nothing is worse than you get all done with the plane and you go to put the motor in, and, and this happened to Mike, he went to put the tank in, and the tank didn't fit. Well, holy, you know, that's a little bit late to be figuring it out. I want to see that everything fits right now. Now, next thing is I'm going to get some, I have to get a threaded piece of eighth inch wire and run it through the exhaust and mark where these holes are going to go. I want to, I, I want to cut those holes right now. It's very convenient to cut them right now. Now maybe some of the new people never heard the Mike Rogers story. Mike built an orange PM a couple of years ago for Pasco. And I mean absolutely finished and buffed the plane before he ever tried to fit the tank. Went to put the tank in. Ah, the tank doesn't fit. Ah, chopped the whole thing apart. Then as if that wasn't insulting and embarrassing enough, what happened is he went to put the plane in the car and the plane didn't fit in the car. So he had to go buy another car. That's an absolutely true story now. I want to shove these down into the exhaust holes and that'll give me a little mark out on the other side where I have to drill the holes. Okay, that gives me a little mark. I just put that on with a Sharpie mark and now I can drill the holes for the muffler bolts. And once I have that little detent, I can just shove a pin in and I like to do this with a Dremel bit. I don't like to do this with a drill because what happens with a drill, it'll catch and go and you have a mess on your hands. The Dremel tool is a lot nicer.
just usually have to kiss that with a, a little exacto knife just to get the eyelet to fit in there just oh come on you sucker these eyelets are just a little bit oversized and you just have to kiss it with an exacto knife here I want a press fit a nice tight fit on that Now I try to dress off all the edges here with some sandpaper and a pencil, wrapped around a pencil. Now what I want to do is harden up with thin CA. I want to get, I don't know, get a couple layers of thin CA just to keep these edges nice and hard. And this, I remember, is an ongoing thing. This is not just a one, one shot thing. Constantly monitoring these edges. brass eyelet keeps that once that fuses sanded in remember the fuse sides are still a little bit oversized here I'll keep as a 440 Allen wrench goes in there and you're tightening the muffler it it'll keep it from chewing that hole up if you don't have that tubing in there eventually that the paint tears that oil gets in there and it starts to wick in and you get a big ugly blotch that's another devil in the details you can see up to this point our fuse side is just a little smaller than that radius on the cowl and since we're trying to get that that real contoured shape I'm going to run a little strip of either 332nd or 16th ply along the edge right along the edge maybe a quarter of an inch wide it's just so that when we you get to the final the final tune up here where the cowling is on for the last time and you can blend from the nose ring back and get all that little sanding starting at the at starting at the spinner and just getting everything just to be perfect start these reinforcements by stripping off some sixteenth plywood see if it's wide enough if it is if it isn't I can just add another layer and I can go over to the jigsaw and strip these off in strips roughly a quarter inch wide and I can triangulate them put a little bit of a back cut on them and then just glue them in place as necessary now I'm going to pick up this edge here so the first thing I'll do is trim that angle and I want to run that strip right along there I can pick up this angle now I won't put the uh, the back cut in here yet this is just to fr I'll leave this overhang just a little bit it'll give me some material to hit that final contour in with I want to get it perfectly in place and just CA it always tack it first make sure it's exactly where you want it as soon as that kicks off a little bit uh, it's not perfect yet okay now I don't want to put the I wasn't thinking right I don't want to put the reverse cut in here because I want to take 64th plywood when I'm all done and wrap right from this piece down into this piece this ties this all together and makes it one big loop one big former when this actually all goes together into one piece that's what we did on a Spitfire and boy that worked well to get that lightweight and that rigidity it's it's just not as easy as it looks at the first shot okay I'll just get the other side off camera and of course I'll leave out the spot for the muffler Is a nice you know what a nice line we have here now obviously when we join this block we'll have to fill that in and then we're going to wrap that 64th plywood or put some kind of a little fillet right in of it that's nice as soon as I get this finalized needless to say hit it with some thin CA a little bit more is once you get these edges right and we're closing in on having them right once you get these right they don't really change you put dope fill or anything on here fills them up you block sand it down 
And I know those guys, they judging the content and judging the, uh, the appearance. First thing they look at, razor lines. Razor lines. They see some sloppy fit, back one row. Okay, pretty much all the holes are cut. Everything has a check fit. All this is edged and sealed. So I'm going to pull the bottom block off now and start working on a bulkhead that goes behind the, ta behind the tank floor. Now one of the things I always do is I try to get that tank floor as far forward as possible. Now when I, I want to be able to use a 6 ounce tank and of course it just fits I could press it in. But what I want to do is take out, relieve this, and this is on the Spitfire plans, relieve this with a Dremel tool and then from that point on I run my bulkhead back. Now I don't like to take any more off of this former. Because in the old days, this was the, the what amounted to be the bulkhead F1. And I like to, even though we have a tank box, I like to have that rigidity in there. So I bring that as far forward as possible. Now I want to just be able to get a six ounce tank, even though we only use a five and a half. This gives us a little, you know, extra security. I want to be able to get that in and up over the nose ring. Okay, don't pull a mic. Okay, now I can strip the bottom block off, and I can start working on that bulkhead. Well, I'm just looking around here at what I still have. I have two of these suckers that jumped out of the mold already. I always, at the end of one of these sessions, like to look around. I'm not going to be able to finish this tonight. The phone started ringing off the hook, and I got a bunch of cardinal kits to put together, so I'm just going to pack this in, pick this up tomorrow, or the next time I get to work back here. Hey, by the way, I love these train videos. Man, thanks to everybody that's been sending this stuff in to me. Now, this morning, before I even start on working at I'm what I did, I made up an experimental cowl. Added some, I got some air bubbles in this one, too. Added some real light cloth that I had. This is really like, I don't know, super light cloth is the right word. Anyway, I'm going to give this a try. I got, let's see i got three of these suckers now to play with, and that's the whole idea here, is I can, once you can start getting these to pop out of the mold, now you can make one with lighter cloth, heavier cloth, more resin, less resin. Now when I make the next one up, again I got an air pocket up here, I'll take care of that, then all this can dry and I'll set up the belt sander and the Dremel tool and, and make three or four or five of these cowlings up all at once. But this way okay, I have one with three layers of cloth, two layers of cloth, and one layer of cloth, and then I can evaluate, is that stiff enough, not stiff enough? Do I need a little carbon in there? I have a lot of choices here. Now here's where having one of those real nice sets of Bob Martens plans comes in real handy. We already know, and this is, that this nose construction, this air venting worked perfectly. We already know that this is a real good angle for angling this because it acts as a geodetic former. So all of the things that we have in a bank here, we want to keep. The things we had with the Spitfire, exceptional cooling, exceptionally good nose construction, and lightweight. I want to keep all this. This is something I don't want to change a lot. These were rolled 64th balsa tubes, but I want to start by getting this former in, and I'll, I'll reference off the back of the tank box, same angle, and then I need to interpolate and get that same um, former up into here in balsa wood before I start grinding away my holes for the tubes. This works so well, I, I don't plan to reinvent anything here. Now the first thing I want to do is lay out this former into a pattern. And I'll only use this piece as a pattern because I'm going to make this up in cross grain balsa with carbon reinforcement. But I, what I would like to do is send this then to Bob Martens just to verify that he's got the plans exactly how we want them. Okay. So with this now as a pattern, I want to make that, now remember this is, this is going to be in there on quite an angle. I want to make this up the way we make all our formers up with the grain going cross, cross, and some carbon reinforcement in the middle. Okay, that's the pattern. Now I'll lay out this out on 16th C grain, three pieces, one grain going that way, one that way, and one sideways. Put the carbon in between. 
and then I'll just have to angle this off for both edges. Okay, now this is 007. 007 carbon, and it's it's in a, a pre-cured strip. This is real easy to lay into formers. In fact, it's probably easier than this, the toe that we've been using. I'm going to try using this now. I, I got this from Ed Gallagher about a year ago, and we're going to start using this up. I think this is going to be a good material. This is available from, I think, from Bob Violet, but I'm not sure. It's called carbon fiber. Let's see. Yeah, BVM. There's the address if you want to get some of this. Again, this is the first time we've used this for structure, but it, the package that I already opened up looks real nice. This is the stuff, by the way, that I was using in the five-bladed props to make the props bars. Now, believe it or not, I just had to learn a valuable lesson that I haven't learned for quite a while. That carbon material can be nasty. I just got a splinter. It'll be 15 minutes to get the goddamn splinter out. Anyway, I wanted to show this. And we're going to try using this, obviously trying to use this material. Always corner to corner. That's the whole, the whole thing in a nutshell. Corner to corner is what you want to do. This might even be a little stronger if you did it with epoxy. I'm not sure. Now you notice the grain is going in the opposite way. And then we'll make up a third piece. Once I get the final fit, I don't want to lay three of these together with the grain going side to side. Now, especially if you use thick CA, this is a good way. Just take an old roll of masking tape. Even better, if, you have, if your wife has a rolling pin she can live without, this rolls out all the extra glue. things you'll find out using this material, and this is stuff I remember from before, you really can't cut this conveniently, easily, it, it chunks and shreds up. The only thing that really works is a jigsaw that I know of. I would plenty of, plenty of thick CA on here, I have a nice, nice sea grain piece. Always easier to get each piece fit and then glue it to the next piece when you're making laminations. I hope that's Joe Adamusco. Okay, I put that edge in with the belt sander and of course just dress this off till it's a reasonably tight fit. I might want to put some carbon reinforcement along the edge, I don't know. I like sandwiching this carbon if if you could believe how strong this material is. And it's about a well, it's much lighter than plywood. If you make these parts out of plywood See, this is one of the ways, it's a little labor intensive, but you can save weight and make it either just as strong or stronger at the same time. It just takes a little time. It's a little time consuming. And the only downside of this, it does take time to get the grain corner to corner, and then that last piece, side to side. Now the last couple of swipes of the sandpaper, I want to get a nice tight fit on this, because a lot of this gets ground away for the air outlet tubes. So I want to make sure right up in the nose, again, any part that's in the nose, real good glue joints, good integrity, nice tight fits. Okay, now what I did, I glued that piece in, got a real good glue, nice tight fit, tight glue joint on it, get a nice fillet in the back. Now the next thing is to dress this off, totally flatten this dimension, because then I have to interpolate back and get this piece built into the, the uh, bottom block. I'll dress the last little bit, little bit of this off by hand. By the way, Joe has told me He's closing in on having the wings ready. And I'm excited. We're going to be getting together real soon for a visit, either to his shop or mine. Kind of looking forward to it. Haven't seen him in a while. I try to flute this out just so there's more airflow going through here. I just need enough material on that I, that I don't weaken a blind nut. And I'm ready to get the, the back piece of this former in here.
what I have to do is run a pencil, a real thin pencil or a scratch mark up inside, get this taped in position. So this is perfectly level and that, that marks out where this former would continue were it to continue right up into the bottom block. Now the best way is to actually use the cowl to make sure you don't have the line moved back or forward. This is just one of those things that once you take the cowling off, now I can get right in there and make my mark. Now, it's going to be pretty much the angle of the cowl break, so it's reasonable to assume we can just interpolate from that, and that will give us the outside of the former, and then we can just take off roughly an eighth of an inch and we'll have it on the first shot. Famous last words. Just remove the eighth inch and you should have what amounts to be a pattern. Now we really did almost get it on the first shot. Just dress it off just a little bit. Now remember I have to put that taper angle on there, but that basically is going to be my former size. And I want to make this piece up the same way I did the other one, out of three pieces of sixteenth with the grain going in various directions to get the strength. Same strength as plywood. Seems like this material is very, very easy to use. And of course, just getting the grain going in. The ideal would be 30 degree angles, but this really has worked well. a little bit away and then try to do a little bit of a, a test fit just to get the angle right. And what happens with a piece with this kind of a curve, in the center it's got the most relief and out at the end it has no relief at all. So you have to kind of, I guess the easiest way to, to put this is just do it by eye. And you have to just keep grinding little bits away until you get it that you're happy with it. Kind of a funny angle it goes in there. Now what's important is that these two parts, when this is in alignment here, that the parts marry up pretty well. I don't want to have any gap in there because the next thing is to put the air exhaust tubes in. Okay, I have a real good, and notice that it's plenty wide too, so if we're off even a little forward or back, it doesn't really matter. But what is important, when you put this bottom piece on, this should all be done so there's plenty of glue in there and this will be nice and sealed. And I'll even seal this with dope or whatever just to make sure, just to make sure if any oil was to work its way back here, we keep the integrity up there. Now I'm just tack gluing in a couple of pieces of carbon reinforcement because I know eventually this is going to get sanded away. And then I'm going to put a little laminate of plywood in here. This will beef this area up. This is one of those areas where you're always grabbing a plane up under the nose. And this would be kind of vulnerable to uh, a little ding. Okay, that carbon will act as a little, little place to wrap that 64th plywood gusset in there, too. No, I got five or six of these pieces of 64th plywood. To make the roll tubes, you'll notice some plywood rolls real easy, and of course we're always going with the grain. Some of it, because of knots in it or whatever, it doesn't roll real nice. That piece isn't so good. Some of it just rolls like a rolling pool. That one's decent. I guess we got a couple of them here. And some of them, they just, they want to split. They're very stiff. So I want to get the piece, I guess this one is okay. That's the most flexible. 
Get it wet down with ammonia and set this up so I can make my balsa tubes and these can be drying. Now actually, I this piece of plywood is so flexible. This, this is a 5 8 piece of tubing and I want to make it just a little oversized that I don't even need the tube to wrap it around. I thought I'd need the tube. In fact, a lot of times I've had to, if you don't have a good piece of plywood, you have to soak it with ammonia. This is not going to even require soaking with ammonia. Pretty nifty. Now, I've rolled that up. I can actually, I, I'll leave the tube in there for now. Just run a little bit of CA down there. The first piece of plywood I've seen it bends so nice. I hit this with a little kicker. Now we're getting up on the end of this video. I think we're going to do the rest of this installing tubes on the next tape, just so we don't be be we won't be in the middle of it. The air exhaust tubes will be on the next tape, but I'll make these up. A couple of minutes we have left over. I have some photos from the old albums. I'll fill it in, so we're not in the middle of doing something when a tape ends. You can take that out. Now, if you can believe that. That is, that is how it's done. Now, if it doesn't come out exactly the way you want, hey, n not a big deal. Just, in fact, you know what I may, may try to do? I have a little bit bigger, this is 7 8 tubing. This is the stuff, I guess, from the old tune pipe days. I guess I could make a couple different sizes here and see which, which I really like the best. Now I put some glue on this 7 8 piece, of course I glued it right to the part, which may lead me to believe that a good way to do this would be to wrap some wax paper or something around this. Now who says, who says it takes a uh, Pollock 14 tubes to learn something? Anyway, this is just plain old wax paper freezer wrap. I'll put some masking tape on this. It isn't really critical having this mandrel. You don't need a mandrel that's a precision mandrel because these tubes are kind of flexible when they're done. But this will be a much better mandrel. Hopefully it'll slide right off the wax paper. A couple little experimental pieces just to see what diameter I really wanted. And it seems like the easiest way to do this, again, you learn as you go. Don't think, you know, you're born knowing this stuff. People that, that try to convince you that they were born knowing this stuff, man, I'm, I'm real skeptical. Having that thick CA in there now will probably be a little bit better. Now I can kind of just just roll that up under its own pressure. In fact, I'll even put a little kicker on it, give it a little second to kick. But and of course, you could make a mandrel out of a broomstick, out of uh, really out of anything. Wax paper. Who says he's dumb? Okay, now I have the old dowel with the sticky sandpaper on it. I can kind of sand that seam out, even though it's not really a critical thing. The reason you're not gonna see that seam is because we'll put that seam facing up so you really never do see it, no matter how you're looking. When you have that bologna slice, you won't look up into that and be able to see it. This is really just for cosmetic reasons anyway. This isn't gonna serve any purpose. Now what I can do is, while I see that seam, I can run some thin CA right down that seam. You can just stretch that seam off. Now what I did wrong on this one, and again, I'm going to make another one up here. I'll, I won't do it on camera. I left too much of an overlap. What you really want to have is, and I remember this from last year now, of course, I want to have an overlap of only about a sixteenth of an inch. I don't want to have a giant overlap. Because what happens is I get that part where it's double thickness here, and it's 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 not a perfect circle. And so I'll just make another one of these up. Now what I decided to do, and I guess this this will either prove to be a good way to do it or not. I wanted to make them to the smaller size after looking at them and after going over by the Spitfire and seeing just how how they look and how they angle out. If I get the diameter too big, they're not going to look right. I'm going to lose some of the profile view too. So what I did, I wound up using 5 eighth tubing 
and to bend it around the smaller size tubing, what was happening, it was splitting and cracking and everything. So I resorted to soaking it with ammonia. And what I'll do, I'll let it dry on a mandrel overnight now, come back and work on this tomorrow. Actually, we're at the end of the tape. I don't know what I'm getting panicky for here. I could even take these off if I want to. There's no glue on them. This will just give it the set. I guess if you wanted to rush it, you could use a hair dryer to dry the ammonia. Let, let the tube set overnight. Then I can draw a, a nice line up here and get a nice glue seam on it. Again, I don't want a big fat overlap. I want it to just be the tiniest, tiniest little glue seam. Ah, the eggs are really starting to hatch here at the end of this session. Okay, on the next tube, what we're going to have to do is get the holes cut. I'm molding up the tubes. They'll dry overnight. Here's the other nice thing. Having the plans, I can really get the, the marks of where this would be in the front to back mode, too. The plans are so important. Now, even if you were making a cardinal, you could use these kind of exhaust outlets. And we're really happy the way our molding technology seems to be getting better with each session. In fact, I may write something for Stunt News about that. It seems like something an awful lot of people could benefit from. Anyway, I'll get the last of these photos on this tape, and hey, see you on the next tape. Again, thanks to Bob Black for his contribution to this little video, and hey... This is hanging in a place of honor, Bob. A place of honor. Now, Joe and I, when we spoke on the last video, we decided we want to try to simulate the, the ribs in the rudder. That's another thing I'm going to give some thought to maybe doing, making the fin sheeted, making the rudder. We can make it thicker, of course. Getting the ribs in there, that'll add one scale detail. Again, there's just so many possibilities here.
uncompromising backbone of naval air tradition, the aircraft carrier, a postage stamp airfield 2,000 miles away from any vestige of dirt, gravel, or concrete. And here, far out on the perimeter of America's defense, flying skills are finely honed to the no-nonsense perfection of achieving that which is proposed here. That man can launch from this abbreviated strip fly a far-ranging mission of perhaps a thousand miles and return. Find this little airfield in any kind of weather and be successfully recovered to perform this same mission day after day, year after year. These carriers are the proving ground for naval aviators, the proving ground from which all Blue Angels come. Confident in their own ability, with a quiet maturity that flows from knowledge and skill. But there is more than this in the makeup of this corps of elite naval aviators. The Blue Angel commander says, Our selection process guarantees us the top aviator and naval officer. We go to the Bureau for a screening, a fitness report screening. And I get a reading on the officer as to where he stands among all the applicants, where he stands among his contemporaries. And I start looking at him from there. Now, the Bureau would stop at that if they were going to, for instance, be considering him for his next rank or anything of that nature. Now, we just get started there. selected the first year I applied. I was selected the second year, so it was in fact a year and a half of training. I think the main thing that's involved here, of course, is the fact that it's a position that we've all strived for very diligently, something that you look forward to, or at least want to have the opportunity to do it. And probably the most important thing is that it is a bunch of professionals working as a team. And I think this in itself instills within each of us the feeling of pride we have once we are, in fact, on the team. A feeling of pride. Professionals working as a team. These phrases characterize the traditional approach to the Blue Angels mission.
From Pensacola Naval Air Station in Florida, the Blues carry out their mission to demonstrate precision techniques of naval aviation to naval personnel and to the public. The Blues are composed of seven pilots, a maintenance officer, and 100 enlisted personnel who comprise the maintenance team. Our maintenance personnel, I'm sure, are the best in the world by far. We've had instances of an aircraft down from a broken engine, and they've been able to procure an engine from a thousand miles away and have it put in within eight to 12 hours, which is phenomenal by normal standards. So these maintenance people that we have, like the pilots themselves, are hand-picked. They work many, many long hours and do an outstanding job. The team performs more than 85 demonstrations a year. Chicago, New York, and small remote towns, Vernal, Utah, and Bozeman, Montana. <laughs> 